This is uh, fun for me. Bob and Al said to me, you're the board chair. Just come tell some stories about why you're passionate about PBL, and then you can tell people about your, your deep dive. So that's what I'm going to do. And I realize, I think this is a good thing for, for you all to do, is what's your PBL story or stories? What's your first experience with PBL? Were you in a PBL classroom? Or like Bob, do you have a PBL project that you remember? What's that? And I realized I didn't have any PBL. I graduated in 1969, great school district. Maybe now a couple of those teachers would say, we taught you PBL, but I don't remember it as PBL. So here's my first PBL experience. I am a freshman in college. I go to Washington, D.C., and I intern for a congressman from Ohio. And mostly what you do is you answer constituent mail. I got the weirdest letter. The letter says, dear congressman, four weeks ago, I tried to hand in my paper, and the teacher told me it would cost a quarter. A week after that, I handed in my paper, and she said it would cost me 50 cents. Two weeks ago, I tried to hand in my paper, and she charged me 75 cents to get a grade. And finally, this week, it cost me a dollar to bring my paper, to get a, pa get a grade on my paper. Can you help me? So I called the principal and I said, we got this strange letter from one of your students. And he says, well, here's the deal. There's a fifth grade teacher trying to teach taxation without representation. <laughs> so, so, I, I, so I say to him, would it be OK if the congressman called the, got the, you get the teacher and the student in the room next week, and the congressman's going to call them? So of course, the press secretary taught me a, a major lesson, which is he called the Cincinnati Enqu Enquirer and had a reporter at the principal's office, too. And so the student gets on the phone and tells the congressman the same story I just told you. And then the congressman says, well, why did you write me? And he goes, well, I went to my teacher after a dollar was being charged. And I said, I can't take it anymore. And she said, write your congressman. <laughs> So I did. So, the, con so, the, congress so the, the teacher gets on the phone with the congressman, and the congressman says, can you end this tax? And she said, sure. And the next day, the headline in the Cincinnati Enquirer on the bottom of the first page says, congressman removes unfair taxation from elementary school. <laughs> By, by the way, these are in the days when members of Congress could actually get things done. <laughs> so now fast forward to 2004. I had started the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, as some of you know, in 2002. And I get a call from a wonderful uh, superintendent, Marsha Capuano, in Lawrence Township, Indiana. Anybody here from Indiana? Whoa, that was one of the states who didn't make it. OK. And um, she says, Ken, I want, you, I, I want you to be on an advisory board on 21st century education, and I want you to come a half day early to see some of the stuff we're doing. So I get there, and what's interesting to me is that uh, they took me on this fabulous exhibit of the Civil War. And the kids were doing both reports and pictures and they were standing by their reports and pictures and doing, and, you know, and I love that because instead of just doing a quiz on the Civil War, they were curating an exhibit on the Civil War that every student was involved in and you could walk up and ask them about their part of the Civil War and I thought it was good, I liked it. But afterwards, I was meeting with the teachers to sort of debrief and they said, well, actually, we're gonna be doing something much bolder and braver than this do you want to see? And I said, sure. So they take me outside, and there's an acre. In the, it's a relatively new school. There's an acre in the back that's desolate. And they said, this is going to be an environmental park, and we have gotten the principal's permission to allow all 40 fifth grade students to design it. 
the, 50, uh, the 40, 45th graders, I got it, the 40 students each were given a sixth, a map of a sixth of this environmental park, and they submitted the plans for a sixth of a park, and then they voted on the six best pieces, and a, and a landscape design firm took the six best pieces and turned it into an environmental park. Yeah, isn't that unbelievable? Think about what that is, the empowerment of actually doing something. It's actually better than the Civil War exhibit, right? They were given the opportunity to do something real and pragmatic. But I call, because this is like a decade later, so in preparation for here, I called and the assistant in the office of that school, it's elementary, uh, Sunrise Elementary in Lawrence Township, she says, oh my gosh, there's almost nobody here that would know that story anymore. And I said, well, is there anybody? She puts me through to the art teacher who was responsible for this, and he answered the phone. So I told him the story I just told you. I said, did I get it right? He said, yeah. I said, well, what happened since? He says, well, actually, it's a little sobering, which is, is that the park has fallen in, dis in disrepair. We didn't have the funds to maintain it. We didn't have the interest in maintaining it, and it's just sort of wallowing back there. He says, but there's a recent happy ending. The elementary school a year ago became an international school, and the students have decided this summer they're converting it into a garden, and this fall they'll be selling the produce from the garden and funding a water project in Africa. So I, I think that actually from both sides of it, how much it takes to maintain the momentum, and you can lose the momentum, and then you gotta, you gotta grab it again. So now fast forward to the final story, uh, passion story which is, I was telling that story for a long time until about 18 months ago. And then I found my new favorite PBL story in Pomparog Regional District uh, 15, I think it is, in Connecticut. I walk in, they called me from the road and they said, you know, we know you're gonna be in Connecticut, you gotta come see our high school. And there's a digital academy, um, uh, entrepreneurship class in the high school that we want you to see. I walk up to it, it was bedlam, it was crazy. Everything's going on, constant movement, I couldn't get a handle on it. I say to the first student, what is going on in here? He goes, well, did anybody tell you the premise of this entrepreneurship class? I said, no. He goes, well, here's the deal. 30 of us in the class, we all had to produce a business plan for improving something in the school. And we had 30 business plans. They then put us in teams of 15, and the pairs had to choose the better of the two plans between them. Then we had 15 plans. We were in groups of three, and we had to choose the best of the three plans. And so we got to one plan. And I said, well, what's the plan? He says, oh, no, no, no. You see Sally over there? It was her plan. She's the CEO of the company now. I said, OK. So I go over to see Sally. And I say, she said to me immediately, well, has anybody told you the story of this company? I said, no, they told me the story of the class, but not the story of the company. She says, well, I had to improve something in the school. We had a terrible problem for the student's perspective. About two months ago, two kids show up, two students show up at a dance with vodka in their water bottle. The following week, Two kids showed up in school with vodka in their water bottle. The following week, the school board banned water bottles. Literally, banned water bottles. The students are going crazy. We, don't, we can't, you know, we're in sports teams, we're dehydrated. What's going on? What are we going to do? She goes onto the internet and finds out that there's actually an indicator for alcohol. Green light, red light. No alcohol, green, alcohol, red light. So she takes a 3D, um, what, what, a 3D design printer and redesigns the cap, thank you for that, and redesigns the cap so that she can insert the indicator in the bottle. She goes to the school board with, with this new bottle and says, how many of these will you buy? They say 400. So, So I, I, I wanted to make sure I got the story right. So in preparation for here, I called the teacher and the principal, and I said, am I telling this story right? They said, well, 
you should know that we came in second in the state in the competition for that product. So I said to her, well, um, has this whole process ever gone wrong? And she says, actually, the first time we did this, we came in first in the state. And I said, well, how did that go wrong? And she goes, well, we created, a, that year we were supposed to create uh, uh, entrepreneurial websites to sell a product that the kids wanted to sell. And they wanted to sell cupcakes for events before the cupcake rage. And so they went to the state fair with a, the state tech fair with a website selling cupcakes and they won first place. I said, well, what went wrong? She said, the following week I get called into the principal's office and he says, I got an irate guy on the phone. He thought it was a real site and he's counting on $2,000 worth of cupcakes being at his wife's birthday party tonight. <laughs> and to prove it, he had transferred $2,000 into the high school's PayPal account. And of course, <laughs> so of course, she feels terrible. And she gets on the phone with the wife. And the wife says, please don't feel bad. This husband of mine thinks he's always right. I told him that it wasn't a real sight. I told him it was fake. And now for the rest of my life, whenever I get to this situation and he's sure he's right, I'm just going to be able to say cupcakes. <laughs> so the issue is, is as you have these great examples of project-based learning, can you just sell that story? And I, the, my final story is, is I had a superintendent in the Northwest who said to me, Ken, I've got a consultant that wants me to do community engagement around project-based learning. What should I do? I said, you should fire them. You can't have a conversation with communities about PBL. What you need to do is have a conversation with communities about critical thinking and problem solving and communication and collaboration and creativity and build a consensus on what competencies we want for our kids. And then we'll be able to create an environment where PBL will thrive. And that's what I'm going to talk about in my deep dive. It's been a pleasure to be with you.